On last week's episode, we painfully stripped the original paint off the ammo 964, removed imperfections, rust-proofed, primed, and sanded the body, all in preparation for a concourse paint job. Then we added new custom wheels, stripped the interior, repainted the roll bar, installed custom headlights, put the car back together, then installed a clear bra on every painted surface. This is an episode not to be missed. That and so much more on this fourth and final episode of the ammo 964 restoration. Uh, all the way in. Oh. Touch our paint on. I can hear it. First, the paint prep team pushes the 964 into position near the Eurovax hanging from the ceiling everywhere, which will eventually collect the dust as they sand the primer once again. But before that, it must be taped off and every window carefully sealed with plastic to prevent the sand and paint from entering the interior. Once sealed up, Anthony and Joe inspect the primer for any tiny imperfections by hand with an additional guide coat, basically starting where George left off last week. If you remember from last week's video, George's last step was 600 grit, so Anthony and Joe are refining even further with 800 grit. Honestly, as they were sanding and sanding, the paint looked so good that I imagined myself just keeping it looking white. As it was explained to me later, this slow sanding and primer process is key to a concourse paint job. Any imperfections in the primer now will show through and cause blemishes in the final product, so careful refinement here is critical. Next, the car is thoroughly washed to remove the remaining bits of primer dust left over from the previous sanding. Everything is about cleanliness. In fact, there was more time spent prepping, wiping, air blowing than actually paint or primer being shot onto the car. It's definitely the case of measure twice, cut once, or in my case, clean 150 times, then spray once. After the wash and dry, Anthony found a tiny spot that wasn't 100% perfect, so he marked it with masking tape and had his guy sand it again. Next, it was time to decide the color of the car. Now, I've been flip-flopping back and forth for weeks on what particular color I wanted, but ultimately for me, black is the best color when it's clean. And as we all know, it's a massive pain in the butt to keep it looking clean, but that's probably why I'm fanatical about the process and techniques used when cleaning and protecting a car. So I told Anthony, I wanted black. He said, cool, what color black? What do you mean, what color black? So Larry, there, right here in my hand, there's about 20 different blacks. There's very many different variances. There's bluer, there's redder, there's greener. You can go to many different tones. Out of here, do you see any black that you particularly like? Uh, let's say this one. I'm totally guessing. Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> Bentley L041, called Beluga Black, is a deep, rich, oil slick black. It's a much wetter or glossier look that contains no other pigments or hues. Now, the original Porsche paint tends to have a white or lightish hue to its black color from what I'm told, but this particular color will have a lot more pop to it. So Larry, the next steps are going to be the car has been completely primed and block sanded. We blocked it at 220 and 320 grit. From that step forward, we then sanded it down, sanded the cleat bodywork down, the cleat primer down with 400, 600, 800. That is the perfect finish for a base coat to be applied. It's the smoothest finish, gives it enough grit, it's coarse enough for the base coat to embed into it. We're going to be applying a waterborne paint onto this vehicle. The reason why we're using waterborne is there's less solvents to harsh through the clear coat. It gives it a nice clear finish. So at that point forward, we're going to apply two coats of base onto the vehicle. Once the base coat has been applied and dried, we're going to inspect the entire vehicle for any imperfections, anything we don't like, anything we see that we're not happy with. If we see anything, we'll point it out, we'll denib it out, and we'll get rid of those imperfections. At that point, we'll apply a final coat of base and then two coats of clear coat. Once the clear coat is flashed off, the entire car will be dried and baked. In automotive paint, there's three types of hardness that we use in the clear coat. There's a slow, there's a medium, and there's a fast. Going against popular belief, people tend to think that a faster hardener will in fact dry the car faster. This is not true. When you use a slower hardener, each layer of clear can then dry at the same time. The solids can escape at the same time. We will bake your car several times in order to force dry these solvents to come through the clear coat. This will ensure and allow you to be able to wrap your car after seven days. Okay, so that was a lot of information, but the important part to take away from this is that the paint will be ready for waxes, sealants, and even a clear bra after a week or so. 
Okay, I can feel it. Most of you are about to write a comment on YouTube saying, what? This doesn't make any sense, but hold your horses. Now, in most body shop situations, seven days is not normal because they don't sand, paint, bake, sand, paint, bake multiple times. The sanding and baking is what actually helps the gases come to the surface and release themselves from the paint. Now, if you force the gas out process to take place, or in other words, make it easy for the paint to release the gases, then you've decreased the normal waiting period of 60 to 90 days. Now, most body shops understandably do not take the time to allow the car to go through this many steps. It's just not economical for an average daily driver. But for a concourse paint job, this step, as well as many others you're about to see, are what makes it unique to normal paint jobs. So before you write your comment, remember the 60 to 90 day rule still applies, but if you add the extra steps J and B is doing for the Ammo 964, you can decrease the gas out period. Before the remaining pieces get primed, Lurvin, another J&B veteran, lays down a light coat of rust prevention sealer on the newly exposed areas of the frame after the last round of sanding. The guys also added epoxy sealer in the seams of the frame to prevent any water from slipping behind the metal and potentially rusting again. Like I said in the last video, this car could literally be dropped in the ocean and not rust. With the entire vehicle equally primed, J&B did something I've never seen before. All the walls were covered in plastic sheets from floor to ceiling, and the floor itself was rinsed down in water prior to spraying any black paint. This technique is used to minimize the chance of dust sticking to the surface while applying the paint, which is a common mistake and a pain in the butt most body shops have to deal with on a regular basis. The plastic sheets, however, attract the dust through static electricity and the wet floor simply catches the floating dust and keeps it from collecting on the car, creating dust nibs. This extra thought now will prevent denibbing later in an overall cleaner job. It's now time to add the first or base layer of paint. Notice how light or thin the first coat is. Its purpose is to give the following layers better adhesion. If you try to go too fast and too heavy this early in the process, you could potentially see runs in the paint. With the car almost completely disassembled, painting the frame, door jams, and tight areas become much easier and makes the repair undetectable as no transitions or blending is needed. After about 15 minutes, the base coat number one is dry and base coat number two is ready to be applied. This layer is thicker than the previous step. Notice his slower arm movements. This will lay down more paint. The same idea when detailing a car and a polisher. The slower your arm speed, the more aggressive you are to the paint. With slower back and forth movements, the spray gun is allowed to release more paint for a given area, which builds up its thickness at a faster rate. Once the second base coat is applied, Joe sets up the blowers, but these are not your typical fans or air movers. These are magnetic wall-mounted air amplifiers that accelerate the dry time of waterborne and solvent paints by creating turbulent air that moves the release gases away from the paint as opposed to a regular fan that will simply blow the gases back at the surface. Notice the waviness of the plastic on the windows. This is the turbulent air created by the blowers. Next, the car is baked at 145 degrees for 40 minutes to allow the metal to reach roughly 90 degrees. This, along with the previous blowers, allows the paint to cure quickly and for Jane b to continue adding layers of paint. After the 40 minute 964 sauna, Lurvin waits until the paint cools down to about 70 degrees before a third and final layer of Bentley Black can be added. This last layer was added for safety. Making sure all the parts from every angle are equally painted is important. Then the guys shut off all the overhead lights and used a powerful paint light, similar in concept to our smaller detailing pens, but this one has a bit more illumination to reveal areas of the frame that are not evenly covered with paint. This requires a very good eye to discern between slight differences in pigment hues, indicating how many layers are on that particular area and if another shot of paint is required. Notice this square piece of metal on a wooden stick. The metal square represents my car. Now during each stage of the painting process, Lurvin would spray the same paint used on my car on this test board. From a manufacturing perspective, we call this batch retention to ensure every batch is exactly the same as the previous samples. I had no idea this took place in the body shop world, but it makes sense now. Each unique color is tested and matched to a sample square when blending is required so that the repair is actually undetectable. Pretty cool. With three layers of paint on the car, it's now allowed to cure overnight. Tomorrow, however, comes the shine. Bright and early the next day, Lurvin mixes the clear coat cocktail of Glasserit 923255 and Hardener 92994 
and slow reducer 352216 for those of you keeping track at home. The floors are rewashed again as they dried overnight, and with his suit on and the clear coat ready, he applies the first layer of insane shine. Watch how the relatively matte finish turns into a deep, wet reflection. Well, look at the door on the left versus the door on the right. Absolutely incredible, and that's just after the first coat. Once again, the first coat of clear is relatively thin and light to avoid runs, setting the stage for the next thicker coats. When the first coat is completed, our retention panel is cleared and laid next to the car to dry at the same time and under the same conditions. And after baking for another 40 minutes at 145 degrees, another mixture of clear is prepared and ready for layer number two. Notice again, his arm speed is slow and the gun is laying down thicker and thicker coats of clear. The camera here isn't doing any justice. It was so shiny that I was actually having to dial back the aperture as the layers increased due to the brightness. In fact, he was laying down so much clear that he ran out three quarters of the way through and needed to refill his gun. Now at this point in the restoration, it really sunk in. I began to realize how ridiculously, amazingly stunning my car was gonna look. To my point, the frame had the same deep, rich look as the outside of the car, which is also crazy. So all the work in the past six months was becoming evident while I was filming this particular scene. Once he finished adding the second coat of clear to the retention square, he then inspected the panels for any areas that needed a light touch-up or slight imperfection repaired. The panels were literally looking like a piece of glass, and in the adjoining spray booth, all the individual parts have been going through the exact same process. Notice how each tiny part is perfectly mounted with wooden sticks. My headlight rings, shark fins, brake ducts, mirrors, rear wing, rear deck, and bumpers all suspended from their stands. I felt like it was a museum of Porsche parts. I wanted to take them home and hang them in my house just like this. Modern art for the car guy. After a night of baking, the pieces of art were pulled out of the booth and into the next department, post paint or the sanding department. Joe and Anthony first discussed the next steps with respect to grits used in the sanding. For the 964, they decided to scuff the door jams first with yellow scuff pads. Then, block sand with 1000 grit to remove the heavier imperfections. With all things being equal, block sanding is actually more aggressive than machine sanding, which is somewhat counterintuitive because you think of a machine as more powerful than your hand, which may be true, but the block being used has no interface pad or cushion to soften the transfer of pressure from your arm to the paint. This results in more cutting. For the next step, however, Anthony uses a machine on a large flat area to refine the previous block sanding marks with 1200, 1500, and eventually 2000 grit. Notice the black space between the machine, or the source of power, and the sandpaper. This is what's called an interface pad. This pad absorbs the power and softens the aggressiveness for further and further refinement. Because of the extreme procedures for cleanliness, I only noticed Lurvin remove one dust nib after round one of painting. To do it quickly, he uses a razor blade to carefully shave off the nib by hand before sanding the entire panel along with the rest of the car. Notice the sides of the razor blades are taped to prevent unnecessary scratching. My favorite part of filming these videos is watching and learning the tricks that aren't taught in books or schools. I have so much respect for this level of skill. Now this is where the concourse paint job starts to pull away from a regular paint job. After the post paint sanding, the 964 now goes back into the booth for one last layer of clear coat. Lurvin prepares the paint by cleaning it again with air and solvent wipes then coats the floor with water one last time. I thought the previous layer of clear made the car pop, but I was completely wrong. After sanding the clear and then adding a fresh coat on top, it's, it's a challenge to describe in words just how unbelievably wet the car looked in person. Afterwards, it was baked again overnight. The next day was dry, warm, and sunny, which means I was away detailing cars after a long, cold winter, so the guys at the shop took the car outside to bake in the sun, and then took a cell phone video to add to the story. Curing naturally outside is another great way to speed up the gas out process, further ensuring I could wrap the car before it left the shop. Next, the car went back to the sanding department to refine the body and all of the miscellaneous parts by hand up to 3000 grit. Then the car was pushed across the shop into the polishing department. Of all the departments at J&B, this is the one I obviously felt most comfortable in. I really wanted to feel the difference between how brand new paint on my car compared to cured factory finishes I'm usually working on. 
Traditionally, most body shops use rotary polishers along with wool pads to remove sanding marks quickly and efficiently, which makes sense. However, as a professional detailer, most of the paint I work on is very cured or hard and typically direct from the factory, so using a dual action random orbit machine is more suitable. However, with advances in technology in machines, pads, and liquids, the gap between the cutting power and speed of the rotary and the efficiency and no swirl movement of the large throw DAs on the market today has been shortened enough to test one against the other. So, Anthony and I took our respective machines on half of the driver's side door. I was using the Rupes Mark II with a Meguiar 6 inch extra cut disc and M100, while Anthony using a DeWalt rotary and a 9 inch wool pad and heavy cut compound. After round one, both machines cut surprisingly well and the 3000 grit sanding marks came out without much of an issue. Next, we switched to foam pads and polish. I used the Rupes yellow foam pad and M205, while Anthony used a pink foam pad and polish. Again, each machine performed well and the results were pretty similar. Dealing with brand new fresh paint is challenging to handle the amount of residue coming off the paint due to its softness and somewhat sticky characteristics of any new paint job. Although the results were very similar, I think having a larger size pad is helpful in these particular situations to increase the surface area to help manage the amount of residue coming off of new or soft paint. This was a very helpful comparison. As you can see, I was absolutely thrilled to use this as a data point in my polishing skills, and I always enjoy learning from other professionals. The old saying still holds true in paint polishing. If your method works for you, then keep doing it. The variations between machines, pads, compounds, polishes, and ultimately the user's skills makes a definitive answer like, this one's better than that one, a foolish statement. The goal is to get the paint looking flawless. How you get there is based on what works best for you. With the paint polished and looking amazing, it's now time to head back over to see George for reassembly. When I arrived the next morning, George was already in the car ripping up my carpet, which wasn't part of the plan. I later found out that I had a small leak in the bottom of the car due to the holes cut out for the JRZ suspension. The rubber gaskets must have popped out while on the track and allowed drips of water to seep in, causing the cushions under the carpet to get wet. So at this point, George wasn't going to move to the next step without repairing the carpet issue and the holes first. Once the wet carpet was removed and the remnants vacuumed up, he prepared the car for an interior paint job. With the new roof installed, the metal inside needed to be primed and painted to avoid future rust. Then the base coat was applied by can and allowed to dry. Next, the final color coat was applied by can as well. This again is a precautionary step as the headliner will cover the roof, but avoiding rust is imperative when you're living in the northeast. With the roof drying, George then cuts out the soundproof material for the floor of the vehicle with a stencil he made for each area of the interior. Meanwhile, with the interior getting sound deadening material, I seized the opportunity to clean all the plastic panels removed from the interior once we found the leak. Pretty cool doing an interior detail on my car without actually being in the interior and having everything on one table. This was just too weird to not take advantage of this experience and get a bit of cleaning done in the process. As the interior started coming together, George needed some advice from Frank about the roof. These metal hangers are what hold the headliner to the roof, and since Every single aftermarket piece for any car ever never fits perfectly. George had to then cut and reshape the wires to match that of the roof and wanted to discuss it with Frank first. The next morning was super exciting. I received my new headlights, which arrived from the retrofitsource.com. These came with ammo etched in the lenses, created in a sandblasting booth. The new headlights would replace my stock lights, which are absolutely horrific at night. You can't see anything. The customization options are endless with these kits. They come in bi-xenon projector headlights, HID bulbs 4300K or 8000K with optional angel eyes in different colors, clear or fluted lenses, chrome or plastic rings, and all the wiring necessary to retrofit from the old setup to the new one. To say I was excited was an understatement for sure. I felt it gave the car a bit of a facelift while making it safer to drive at night. Now, with the interior getting a facelift as well, I thought it was perfect timing to refresh the color of the roll bar from wrinkle black to wrinkle red. For powder coating, I visited my buddy Mario at Performance Industries. You guys all know him from the wheel repair videos, but they also have an amazing powder coat booth and massive oven to bake and cure the powder coat when done. Mario and Evan found the exact color to match my seatbelts, which added a bit of pop to my otherwise monotone black interior. I'll be back in a few days to pick them up before installation. 
Meanwhile, back at the shop, George was stenciling the roof to cut out the soft backing material that would be placed between the metal roof and the suede headliner. Not only will this cut down the noise and vibration, but it also adds a bit of softness or cushiony feel to the suede. After dropping off the roll bar at Mario's, I visited Matt Figliola at AI Design. These guys have been building custom cars for years, so I wanted to see if he had any extra suede that I could use for the intricate trim work in the interior. He helped me understand the sizes and cuts I would need for the edges of the carpet that once had vinyl on it, I'll be now updating to suede to match their pre-ordered suede headliner coming in this week. While we were waiting for the pre-cut headliner, George continued to piece together the car part by part. First was the quarter panels and the doors, then the door panels, then the deck lid, and so on, each part being carefully handled as a scratch now would require a repaint and delay the entire restoration. Then the bumper and brake duct kits installed, front spoiler, freshly painted black window trim, and new rubber gasket seals around all the jams. But just then, one of my longest projects arrived from Canada. The custom 17-inch Design 90 wheels originally designed for the Porsche, but only in the 16-inch size. However, since I installed the 965 Big Brake kit, the 16-inch rims don't fit over the huge calipers anymore. So, my beloved D90 rims became useless at this point. I then contacted my buddy Dan Pye from the Augmented Wheel Company for some advice about how to pull this custom wheel off. So the challenge to us was make a D90 wheel, fits over big reds, stronger, lighter, and, uh, and a more modern wheel based on, based on all of the other modern touches that you've done to the car. So uh, behold, this is it. Probably, uh, probably the first of its kind uh, in the world. A 17 inch Ford 6061 T6 Porsche D90. I only wanted to do this if the wheel was gonna be 100% accurate, otherwise I'd see the imperfection or the slight inconsistency, especially with respect to the degree of concavity of both the front and rear wheels, and it would drive me completely insane. Now, with the perfect set of wheels ready to be installed, we needed to clean up the wheel wells before putting on some new shoes. George added a thick coat of Raptor liner to the fender walls to further protect the frame and to create a clean backdrop for the big red brakes to pop out when the wheel is on. At this point, I couldn't wait any longer. I had to quickly install the wheels just to see how it would look against the ridiculously clean and mirror-like paint. But if you notice, I'm missing a center cap to the wheel on the front passenger side. I asked everybody where it was, but the only answer I got was, uh, I'm not really sure, ask Joe or Ant. Very suspicious, but I knew they were up to something. Meanwhile, our latest arrival finally showed up, and it was the pre-cut suede headliner with white stitching. To speed up the process a bit, George asked his buddies Stephen and Hassan from Mobile Innovations in New Jersey to help install the headliner properly. The suede needed to be cut slightly for a snug fit with no sagging, then the edges are glued with upholstery adhesive, stretched and smoothly laid down on the roof. The next day, Steve finished covering the B and C pillars in suede and surprised me with a custom-made spare tire cover with the ammo logo in suede. This was a beautiful touch to hide the mechanical parts in the trunk. Okay, now it was time to protect my track car. This is the part of the story where we're going to divide the crowd. Now, you may be asking yourself, why would I put clear bra on brand new paint? Well, I'm going to drive the hell out of it and, of course, take it to the track. This is when I'm told I'm not supposed to bring it to the track or drive it in the rain or bring it out of the garage unless the stars and the moon align. Well, I can tell you right now, that's not happening. And I wouldn't have gone through this process if I wasn't going to enjoy it. So a clear bra is the only thing that makes sense for this particular car. Again, for my particular car and the amount of driving I'm going to do with it, I'm using Expel Ultimate because of the excessive track abuse it's going to see very soon. This film is roughly 13 mils thick and can handle driving behind race cars on a regular basis. The installation process took about three days with three guys to cover every painted surface of the car. Now, I'll have a separate video on this process to show you the behind the scenes tricks, such as double stacking of clear bra in high impact areas, the use of surgical scalpels instead of razor blades, and how to properly stretch the bra to keep it as one giant piece instead of multiple cuts. Once the job was done, I added ammo reflex and ammo skin to the bra for an extra pop. The paint and bra together were stunning and I couldn't have been happier, especially now that our work is protected. 
At this point, the engine hadn't been started for a few months, and I wanted to make sure it would be lubricated upon initial startup. So I called my friends Mike and Dave from the Porsche 964C4 Club and asked them to come over and help ensure we didn't score the cylinders or cause unnecessary wear with the first crank. To do this safely, Mike unplugged the DME relay under the hood. This powers the engine management software and, for our purposes, shuts off the fuel pump and prevents the engine from starting. Next, Dave adds fresh 93 octane to the tank and cranks the motor a few times to build up oil pressure in the engine before officially starting the car for the first time. This extra little step allows me to sleep at night knowing that the engine is as tight as the body of the car. The initial startup was a bit smoky, which is typical for my 3.8 liter, so all is good and the engine is running well. Next, it was time to install the new windshield and glass that had recently arrived in the parts department. To do this, a cool trick was used I'd never seen before. A string was added to the rubber gaskets, along with a lubricant, to help open the rubber and attach it to the frame of the car. Without this trick, I'm not exactly sure how you would secure the gasket from one side to the other, but nonetheless, it worked. The exact same technique was used on the windshield as well. Then a plastic stick carefully pulled the rubber up from the front side onto the frame to keep the water and dirt from entering behind the glass as it had done before. Afterwards, the roll bar and seats were installed, hinged, plate frame mounted, and it was off to the next building for its last wash, vacuum, and inspection before I'm allowed to leave the shop. First, the engine is covered in a plastic bag, and the paint is rinsed and then shot with ammo foam out of a cannon. This may have been the hardest part for me to just stand by and watch. I realized later by watching the film, I became the customer that drives me nuts standing and pacing back and forth like waiting for a loved one to come out of surgery. With the paint and interior getting a healthy bath, Frank stopped by to take one last look at his work before I drove home later that day, which was unexpected and very much appreciated. He is a unique artist and it meant a lot to me to have his approval before I left. Next up is Bogart. This is the quality control manager. He inspects every car that leaves J&B Body Works. He ensures every panel and every seam is perfect before it gets presented to the customer. Now the only thing blatantly missing or unattached feature of the car is the Porsche hood badge. Remember earlier when my center cap was nowhere to be found? Well, as it turns out, the guys surprised me with a new badge featuring the ammo shield and used the center cap as a stencil for consistency. Like everything else, this too was painted, then cleared, sanded by hand, and polished out to match the shine on the car. The very last step was for Joe, Joseph, and Anthony to attach the ammo shield to the hood of my brand new old car, and my long-awaited drive home was finally here. If you've made it to the end of this four-part series, I hope you can see that it's not just the final result that I was after. It was the experience of watching and learning other trades that seem to get lost or at least pushed down the social ladder because they don't sit behind a computer or trade stocks or give legal advice. Metal fabricators, welders, painters, interior specialists, wheel engineers, sanders, and detailers have all taken the risk to devote their life's work to the cars we see and dream about in magazines. And I hope this small glimpse behind the scenes gives you a deeper appreciation for their immense talent. And with that being said, Restoring, cleaning, and protecting the car is really just the beginning. As it turns out, the most important part is simply driving.